Hello everyone and welcome back to the La Cancha podcast. I'm your host Taj. I hope everyone had a fabulous weekend. I know I did. It was a feel-good weekend in La Liga and we're going to start with the shock of the season. Price's game, Alaves had no points. I believe they only scored one goal and they're coming up against the champions and you'd expect, everyone in their mother expected Atletico Madrid to win this one. But no, Alaves did. They scored from corner early on and then they defended like Warriors. LaGuardia had such a great game. And Alaves in total, they had a, they had a really solid performance. The coach, Javi Caneta, I believe he got his tactics spot on. He made his midfield very compact. He made it very difficult for Atletico Madrid to create anything. Atletico Madrid, for their part, they were horrible. They were horrendous in the first half. They let the first half just glide by. I, I have a theory. They've been dancing with fire for so long and they've been getting away with it in the past couple of weeks and they felt that was going to continue going on. Against Espanyol, they got a lucky break when Lamar came in and I believe Diego Lopez made it an error and he should have saved that. Against Porto, there was a goal Porto got that was wrongfully disallowed. Maybe against Athletic, it was like neither here nor there. But against Atafe, Atafe made like a series of errors that and the red card and in this game like Alaves didn't make those such mistakes and Atletico Madrid's lack of creativity was exposed because a lot of crosses it was just hidden hope and nothing came off Antoine Griezmann has been nicknamed the 007 zero goal zero assists in seven games he hasn't been he hasn't been the Antoine Griezmann of the past we all expected him to maybe play with more fire, with more vigor, but like he hasn't done that so far. But it's not just him, also his teammates. Like Suarez hasn't been as active, although in this game I do think he performed better in this game compared to his previous games. And against Satafe, he was there to score both goals. But no athletic player has given like a complete performance since Lamar. And since Koke. And without those two, those two are the linchpins of this team. Because without those two, we're beginning to see holes in this team. Because Lamar is there to create the extra creativity, to give the extra spark. Koke gives the more balance in midfield. He's able to control games. He's able to recover the ball. He's able to be there to provide support to, and to play, to perform different functions in that midfield. That when he's not there, it's evident that's there in, in their recovery of the ball and their aggression of the ball. And I would say DePaul had a great game in this this one. He was there, his deliveries were genuinely good. Correa is Atleti's best attacker. And that's a bit worrying. Not because Andrew Correa is a bad player, but he's a streaky player. And if you have a streaky player who's your best attacker, that's going to be worrying for the team because there are going to be times where he's not as good and you can't rely on him. And so Atleti needs their other force to step up, but they also need their midfield to step up because the midfield sometimes is just like sideways passes. The delivery into the box isn't good enough in terms of a lot of the set pieces that they have. And Atleti, their team that used to be built is like good from set pieces, but we don't really see that anymore. Even defending set pieces, like the... There's always a sense of like danger when they're defending it. They concede it today or, or this weekend from set piece. And that's something that they need to improve on both offensively and defensively. Also, they need to they need to show a bit more of that aggression, that Cholo is more aggression. I think that's missing. The wing backs have been poor since the return of the season. Trippier hasn't been as good as he was last season. And that's affecting Llorente because, like, when Trippier is on form, Llorente is such a better player. But because Trippier is weak in that area, Llorente isn't able to give what he can. Carrasco hasn't had the best couple of games, but Lodi, who is meant to be threatening his position, isn't having his best couple of games. So it's a lot of problems for Atleti. And they have Milan in midweek, and they have Barcelona coming soon. They should win both games, but with the way they're playing, like you don't, you don't expect them to have that 
winning mentality against those two teams and you don't expect them to win as you would have thought based on their form last season, based on what everyone believes that this squad is capable of. So there's more to come from this Atletico Madrid team and you would hope for that. But with Barcelona, the feel good factor came back. Everyone was happy. It was a brilliant game for them. They created lots of chances. Even Luke de Jong scored. Luke de Jong scored, for God's sake. You know the world's changing when he scored. But the big news was Ansu Fati coming back. Barca's number 10. Coming back after 10 months. Scoring after 10 minutes on the pitch. It's it's brilliant to see a guy like this come back. Especially with the talent we all know he has. Last season could have been his breakout season. I thought it was very good last season. But we're, we're seeing this season, maybe he has a bigger role in the team. Maybe he can fully show his leadership. But it's a lot of pressure on an 18-year-old, in my opinion. But the greatest players from at 18, at 19, they can handle that pressure. like Sort of like Mbappe or Haaland or Messi when he was younger. I'm not saying he's going to be the same player as Messi, but maybe he has an impact like Raul did when he first showed up for Real Madrid and... He scored a bunch of goals and he starts to take on that position of being the leader of this team. And that's what that's what might be the case for Ansu Fati because Barcelona Ismo is hoping that he is the real deal. And so far he's proved to be the real deal. And can he take this team all the way to win the La Liga title or do very well in Champions League? I'm not sure this season, but... In the future is something that maybe he can with the right team around him. Levante, I don't think they had their greatest of games. I they've been struggling with um with the season. It's since last season they've not got a win over fourteen games and Levante fans are beginning to lose patience with Paco Lopez, but I'll say that they need to be more patient with him because he is a guy who gets things right. They haven't been the same team since the game against Real Madrid, but they've had their injury problems, and which has led to the squad not being as good. But given time, I believe you see this team gradually improve and get back to some level of mid-table mediocrity, which is what they should expect over the course of the season. For Barcelona, like things are looking up for them. They have like two tough games, two tough away games against Benfica and Atleti, but... So think about it, despite all the crisis, like if they win a game in hand, which is against Sevilla, which is a tough game, they'll be just two points off Real Madrid. Real Madrid, they ran to a wall this weekend against Villarreal. I think it's it's a game where Unai Emery got his tactics spot on. Villarreal, in parts of the first half, they bossed Real Madrid. They created the better chances. They looked the more likely side to win. I think over, a cor- over the course of 90 minutes, Villarreal created the better chances. And Real Madrid, we're seeing something that we're seeing in all the big games where they've played, whether it's Inter, whether it's Valencia, whether it's Villarreal, or to some extent Real Betis. They've been getting dominated in the midfield. To take the next step to the next level for them as a team, because they're a very good team, but to become what they were in, let's say, 2016 to 2018, they need to have a midfield that dominates games. Because offensively, they're pretty in a lot, but they're lacking that control. And the arrival of Tony Kroos, who's going to be there in their Champions League game against Sheriff, one of the fairy tale stories of the Champions League, but we'll speak about them on another day. He's going to add that security to the midfield. He's going to add that like comfort, like sort of like Koke with Atletico Madrid, although Kroos is a much better player. He's going to allow Real Madrid to create more, to have more control of games, and he's going to make them a much better team. Because at the moment, although they're scoring lots of goals, we're seeing weaknesses in the midfield and in defense. I believe Kroos and Mendy are going to make those problems lessen. Maybe he might not make it go way over the course of the season because Ancelotti is a more offensive coach and that leads to some defensive weaknesses. But he's going to bring that balance to the team and that's what Real Madrid needs on Villarreal they've done well so far in the big games in the big occasions they've taken points off Real Madrid and Atleti and away from home which is something that is should be applauded but the problem is they have too many draws 
they've they've gotten one win and I believe seven draws over the course of all their games this season. If they are to compete with Sevilla, they need to convert a lot of those draws to wins because it looks like Sevilla are getting back to what people expect of them. They had back-to-back wins this time against Espanyol and they went down to 10 men after NSU got a goal, but Rafa Mayer came up big and he scored the goal that lessened all the tension and allowed Sevilla to win this game. And he's the sort of striker who they need because last season they had Luke de Jong, who was the alternative to NSU, but the gap between Luke de Jong and NSU was so massive. But with Rafa Mayer, is a is the kind of striker who could compete with NSU, and I believe that if NSU goes, Sevilla might not miss him that much because he's going to be out for three to four weeks. But given the form of Rafa Mayer is in right now, he might not be such a big miss. And when NSU goes to the African Cup of Nations later this season, Rafa Mayer will be there to step up in this, to step up and to provide that extra level of uh, balance and goal scoring threat that. Sevilla really need in the absence of NSU because that's something that they've struggled with last season when NSU wasn't there or when NSU was in good form their goal output struggle their goal output reduced and this would enable them to improve that also with Sevilla like I'm not too sure whether they are back back because in the game against Valencia a lot of it was due to goalkeeping errors all, like all three of their goals were goalkeeping errors and in this game I don't really rate Espanyol Espanyol they haven't really started well they're really struggling so I'm waiting to see Sevilla against a good mid-table side and or a good top of table side to see just how good they are their Andalusian neighbors Real Betis they're very good they, they've been performing really well in the past couple of weeks they should have beaten Espanyol last week. They were brilliant against Osasuna. They were also brilliant in this game. If not for David Soria and a bit of luck, it could have been five or six. Betis were that good. And it's worrying for Atafe because it's seven games, zero wins. Michel in his last 11 La Liga games has zero wins. But at the same time, you can say that the schedule hasn't been kind on them. They've had to play Sevilla, Betis, Valencia, Barca, Atletico Madrid and they're going to play Ross and next week so that's six of the better teams in La Liga six of the top teams that you, you would associate should be in the top eight you're playing against them and you don't expect Hatafi to win that but it's how they're losing that it's more of an issue because they're showing lack of aggression that usually associate with borderless teams that but now with Michel we don't really see that anymore it was so easy to beat them against Rayo against Betis, maybe against Atletico, you can say you can see that they showed more fight. But we've already spoken about Atletico Madrid's problems in in creativity, and that's the issue for Michel. Can he recover that competitive mess? I don't think he can. But given the schedule, I'll say maybe there's reasons why he might stay in the job. But I don't think he can. For real, Betis, William Cavallo has been improving game on game on and. To have a team that can compete at the higher levels of La Liga, especially balancing Europe and La Liga, you need players like him. Because he, when he's on form and when he's in his best level, he does make a difference. So does Nabil Fakir, so does Canales, and all of those players are playing at a high level. And it does help when you have a striker like William Jose, who's a killer in the area. I think he's Betis's best striker since Ruben Castro, and that's a tremendous compliment to him. And we're, we're seeing... Betis that excites the fans. We've seen the Betis that we all want to see something, a Betis that's enjoyable. And the saying you used to go, always watch Betis. And I think it's true so far this season. Another side who's impressing is Ralph Sociedad, who despite their injuries, they, they find themselves second on the table. And then this game was an end-to-end game between themselves and Elche. Mikel Oyasabal finally got the winner after missing two sitters that I couldn't believe he missed. He's now in the top 10 goal scorers in Rasa Sedan's history, in La Liga at least, which is something that I really like because a team like Rasa Sedan and Athletic, they usually rely on like players who are marquee players, who are benchmark players, who stay in the team, who can 
produce the values of Ralph Sociedad and, and to have a player like him who's the first captain to win a title since the since the eighties, to see him staying on the team, see him being loyal, that's very good for a club like that. For Okay, they're scratching their head how they lost this game. They had very good chances. And it's been a, a poor week for them. They've lost back to back games. They were Florida outplayed against Villarreal, and this game was a lot closer. But it's also been a tough week for their neighbors, Valencia, who everyone were super excited about Valencia at the start. We thought maybe they could compete for the Champions League. But reality strikes. The injury problems haven't helped, but they've also played teams of the highest quality, Madrid, Sevilla, Athletic. And in this game, it was a tough, hard draw. And on Marcelino's return, I love the reception he got from the Stein crowd, recognizing his great work because he was the coach that brought the Copa del Rey to them, the, f- the first title in 11 years at that point. And he was also the coach who got them to a level where Valencia fans believe they should be aspiring to. So it was nice to see that reception on the field, athletic, they were tough as usual, very hard to break down, Offensively, they didn't really offer much, but they scored from the set piece, which is one of their, one of their like benchmark, one of their like signature moves. And Valencia, they came back later on thanks to Marcos Andre, who scored after Maxi Gomez got himself sent off. I think that's not too much of a bad sign for Valencia because Marcos Andre, he's a striker who offers something else, and Maxi Gomez hasn't had his best starts to the season. He's had more dives than goals at this point. So <laughs> maybe starting Marcus Andre for the next game against Cavif might not be a bad thing. Uh, for Valencia, the debt issues might be a problem if they are to qualify for Europe. And even if they do qualify next summer, they need to invest in the squad because this squad can handle two competitions, can even handle um, a midweek <laughs> fixture. So uh, Valencia really need to upgrade that. But that's so far in the future. The next is Cadiz. Cadiz, they were outplayed by Rayo Vallecano, one of my favorite teams to watch. Rayo have been brilliant so far. Falcao is having his Indian summer. Three games, three goals. Maximum effectiveness. Isi Palathon had a great game. A fantastic goal. Oscar Trejo, also a player who's very exciting to watch. We're seeing a very good Rayo, a Rayo who shouldn't have any problems staying up so far if they continue this level, but we know it's hard to continue at the level they are, but it's, it's fun to watch them, and every weekend, I genuinely look forward to seeing how they play, because they have such a good manager, and it's such an exciting manager. For Cadiz, it's been a mixed week. They got the win, their first win against Celta on Friday of last week, and midweek of last week, they got a points against Barcelona where Barcelona got a red card and it became like hell to scout the game at the end <laughs> but it wasn't the most exciting game to watch and now they've they've lost to Raya Vallecano but with Cadiz it's going to be like that all season they're going to have moments where they're good they win and other moments where they tie and they lose and that's the reality but for this game it might hurt them extra special because Rayo's is one of their challengers main challengers to stay up and losing against your direct rival is not very good. Another team that had a somewhat mixed week was Osuna, but it's been more positive for them because they've had two wins in their last three games. They beat Mallorca, who Mallorca had a terrible week. They lost to Real Madrid 6-1, and they also lost in this game. They lost late on in this game. And the goals from Osuna, the first two goals were brilliant. You should check them out on YouTube. The first one was great, the second one was even better. Like Both of them are competitors for, for goal of the week and maybe even goal of the month. <laughs> but Mallorca, the wheels are somewhat starting to come off. They've had an injury crisis. In midweek, they rotated the squad, which isn't always something you should, something wise against Real Madrid. But slowly but surely, like I think maybe they will find themselves in a relegation battle. Do they have the quality to survive the relegation battle? Yes, I, I believe in terms of the squad they have, they're going to be one of the more exciting teams to watch, although they will be inconsistent this season. 
another team that's in that profile with exciting players and inconsistency is Celta Vigo. They won late, late, late goal thanks to Dennis Suarez. And I'm really happy for Dennis Suarez because he's had a toughish start to the season. And that follows up from what happened in the summer. So in the summer, a young Celta Vigo uh, youth teamer was moved on to Real Madrid and Dennis Suarez's agent was played an instrumental role in that transfer. So the president, Carlos Mourinho, is like, he goes ballistic. He goes on a press conference and he attacks the agent. And he says that he doesn't want to deal with the agent anymore. He's not going to deal with, with that. And this was at the point where Dennis Suarez was negotiating a new contract. And then Suarez took the side of the agent and that led to a bit of infighting between himself or maybe not infighting, but like positioning in between himself and the club. So to see him recover and score a goal, it's, it's, it's brilliant news for him. It's brilliant news for Celta because when he's on form, Celta is a much better team. It's back-to-back -back wins for them. They're finally starting to creep up the table. And this is why you should always have patience for football because a week ago, we were speaking about Celta, one win in five games. Will we see trouble for today? But now Chakshu has like, got his team back in form and let's see how far they can go with this new form. For Granada, the point against Barcelona gives Roberto Moreno a few like a few more lines to like rope but I, I'm not sure they're not convincing at the moment and I, I don't think he might last long in the job I hope he does but they have to sort out that sort out and they have to start picking up wins because like if they don't they might find themselves in a relegation battle but that's all I have for Spain this week and now we're going to go to England where the biggest game of the weekend was played between City and Chelsea. City gets in a win against Chelsea, perhaps first win against Chel against Tuchel in England, which is surprising because City generally have a good team, but it shows how good of a manager Thomas Tuchel is when he took over Chelsea and they weren't in a good place and he tactically outsmarted every manager on the road to the Champions League. Uh, it's a big win for City and he shows that they still have something to say in this title race. Uh, for Manchester United, they got a pumpkin against Aston Villa, a one-year loss. It was funny what happened towards the end of the game where United had a penalty to level the game. I mean, Martinez was like telling Cristiano in Spanish, like, hey, I want you to take the penalty. <laughs> and Bruno Fernandes ultimately missed. And Emmy Martinez, he's such a troll. If you saw the Copa America, you see how I was like tripping all the Colombian players. It, it, it was He's an interesting character. I love characters like that in football. I don't love what Bruno Fernandes did in apologizing for missing a penalty. I think it sends the wrong message because like footballers are human. Everyone makes mistakes in their line of work and it sends the wrong message to young footballers coming up and you shouldn't be apologizing to entitled fans like missing a penalty. Everyone does that. It's part of football. Liverpool should apologize maybe for their draw against Brentford, but I'm just joking. Brentford, they've had a brilliant start to the season. They beat Arsenal in the first game of the season, as we all know. And uh, yeah, um, it struck points. Maybe a missed opportunity for Liverpool, given how the other teams around them drop points apart from City. And then the North London Derby, the other big game in England, Arsenal won against Spurs. And some of their goals were like brilliant. Some of their goals were world-class. I think the Aubameyang goal was really good. Uh, it's funny because like at one point, Spurs were top in England and Arsenal were bottom. But now Arsenal is like on top of them. It just shows how things change in football and how in football sometimes time is the great equalizer of everything. Like there's all this concept called returning to the mean in stats. And I think in football, like that usually happens given time. Like teams who are with great form, sometimes they'll be less good and teams who are like not so good. Like let's say, for example, Alaves and they can win against the, the defending champions. But those are things that happen in football. In Italy, though, is another big derby. It's the Rome derby between Lazio and Roma. Lazio took a big scalp winning this game. They had the better chances. And um, all credits to them, they were one point behind Roma. And it's a beautiful picture at the end of the game where you see Maurizio Sarri with the bird. And it was just fun to see. Another derby in Italy was between Inter and Atalanta some amazing goals in this game like 
Latara's goal takes my breath away. His first goal is brilliant. I love to see a volley hit that way. And Milanowski's goal, mamma mia. Atalanta players, they love scoring goals like that. They love scoring goals. So they're one of the fun, the most fun teams to see in Europe. Especially how they score goals. Like even if you can't catch your games, like you can, you should catch some of the highlights because some of the goals are world class. And Serie A, like this game had 42 ch- shots. And it just shows... Like Serie A is operating under uh, an old stereotype that it's this boring defensive league when compared to most of the leagues in Europe, it creates a lot of goals, a lot of opportunities. Yes, you might say the defending is not as good as it was in the past, but it's still a fun league to watch and it was embodied in this game. Moving on to their to their rivals, um, into his rivals, Milan, they won a special. It was a special game for Daniel Maldini, the third generation of Maldinis to play for Milan. He scored a goal. You could have seen a spot of celebration. You could see that look in his eyes, how proud he was of him at that moment. And Milan, they're, they're moving on. They're second in the table. They have Atletico Madrid midweek. So that's going to be an interesting game between both of those teams. Juve, back-to-back wins. They're back there. I would say they're back. They're still four points behind top four, six points behind Inter. And Inter, I'll say a favorite, so I don't think it's too bad for Juve to be that far behind them because it means that it's still within their ability. It's still within the, their ability to finish above Inter because if they win both games against Inter, the, they're head on the head in Italy, which I, I think they use in Italy. Uh, so it's... It was all doom and gloom last week, but now things are beginning to look up for Juventus. It's still booming for Napoli, who keep on winning. They keep on getting the wins. There are six wins out of six games. But to Osman, six goals in four games. It's um, he's, he's an amazing striker. And I'm very excited to see what he does in 2022 World Cup. I'm very excited to see what he does this season. But for, from a Nigerian point of view, I think he's our best striker since Abafemi Martin. Um, agree or disagree feel free to tell me after you listen to this podcast <laughs> another striker who's very hot in Italy is Lahovic. keep an eye out for him he's leading Fiorentina to the, right now they're level on points with Roma but it's still early on in the season so let's see what happens later on in the season and see how far I can take Fiorentina because usually they're a team with a lot of expectations but they always disappoint but hopefully they're able to get into Europe this, this season. It's highly competitive in Serie A. All the top teams are doing really well to start the season, which is always something that's good to see. In Germany, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, uh, Rosa went to Dortmund. I'm sorry, Rosa went to Gladbach with his new Dortmund side, and he lost to Gladbach thanks to Zakaria. Zakaria gets in the goal, the only goal of the game. And Dortmund, they find themselves further behind by Munich. Wolfsburg also lost this weekend to Hoffenheim, 3-1. But it was great result for Leipzig, for Jesse Marsh. And they finally got back to winning ways with a 6-0 thumping of Hertha Berlin. Nkunku having a great game. He scored a brilliant, delicious free kick. And he also gave a couple of assists in this game. And it's, again, with a lot of things account of time and you have to give a new manager time to get his tactics right especially when he's lost so many top players and he's new to the job and I feel with time Jesse Marsh will get Leipzig further up the table in the Bundesliga and the season's just starting but as we all know Bayern Munich they, they won again they won against Firth away from home despite the red card like they're they're like dynamite at the moment and now they're top of the table in the Bundesliga. They're three points ahead of Leverkusen and Wolfsburg, four out of Dortmund. So it seems like it's starting to be Bayern, maybe run away with it. But it's still early on. Like Dortmund aren't like that far off them. They can they still have two games against Bayern where they can make up. So we're gonna keep an eye out for that in Liga. It seems like the title race might already be over. I know it's eight games, but. PSG they won again against they won against Montpellier 
Idris Agana Gehe scored a golasso. It's like it's pretty goal scored around Europe this weekend, but this this is one of the best best of the lot. And you should have a look at, at it if you haven't seen it. All eyes were on Mbappe, complaining about Neymar, but this is one of those things that happens between teammates. I think the media is just over sensationalizing it. You have El Chiringuito saying like hey, let's see what that means, but I don't think it means that much. The main competitors who I thought were going to be the competitors, Marseille, they lost against Lund. So it's funny, Lund are second on the table, nine points behind PSG, but Marseille have a game to make up. If they win that game in hand against Nice, they'll be seven points behind PSG, which is doable, but it's tough. And Lund, like, it's crazy to see them just second in the table, <laughs> just given how they, I believe a couple of years ago, they were in second division. So it's just, it's just something that's nice to see. Lille are back in the big times. They're back to winning ways. They've had back-to-back wins. From a Canadian perspective, Jonathan David got a brace. Monaco also won against Clermont Foot, while Lyon dropped points. And I think that's the problem with PSG. I'm sorry, the problem with Liga is that for PSG to be challenged, you need Monaco, Marseille, and Lyon to have great seasons. And the problem is those three teams are super inconsistent. When they are at it, we usually see great title races like we did last season or the season where Monaco won the league or, or I think the one in 2015 was also very close. But they you don't really get many seasons like that. And that's why sometimes like PSG can run away with it with like 30 or something points because like those teams aren't that consistent and we need to see them be consistent to have a fantastic race in, in France. In Portugal, it seems like we're having a good race. The top three are still winning. It's a huge week, though, for Portuguese clubs in the Champions League. Porto welcome Liverpool. Benfica welcome ben, uh, Benfica welcome. I was going to say Benfica welcome Benfica. Benfica welcome Barcelona. While Sporting travel to Dortmund. For Porto and Benfica, I think there's a good chance that they get a positive result, given how Barcelona have played, given how the defensive weaknesses that might be happening at Liverpool and Porto, I saw them play against Atletico Madrid. I was very impressed with how good they were at the press, how aggressive they were. And I wouldn't be surprised if Porto get a result, but Liverpool usually have their numbers, so I could look really foolish at the end of this. <laughs> well, for Barcelona and Benfica, at home, given the, the support of the crowd, Benfica can put up a result against Barcelona, who haven't been... They're not as terrible as everyone says, but they haven't been at their high level. And I think with the current state of Barcelona, it is possible for them to go away to, to Lisbon, which is a tough place, and not pick up all the points. But with football, a bounce of the ball can change everything. And thanks everyone for listening to me this week. I hope you have a fantastic week and enjoy the Champions League games. There are more big games to come over the weekend with Atletico Madrid playing Barcelona, Liverpool playing Manchester City. I believe Milan are playing Atalanta, so... We are going to have a lot to look forward to next week as well. Have a fantastic week. And remember, always have fun watching football.